Fathers, I want you to just think here for a minute. Think about for yourself and and maybe consider your own role as a father, as a dad. And maybe think of those who you had over you as a father or a dad. Maybe, as Suzanne mentioned a little bit, a spiritual father that was has been over you, not only having a maybe a grandfather, but all the, the men that God put as roles in your life. And uh, think about them and think about their lives and think about what they might have said. Think about the sermons that you might have heard on many of those father days uh, that you've heard sermons. What, what are some things that stuck in your own mind? I'm not going to go around with a microphone. What are some things that, that just left a mark in your life? What are those things that maybe another man spoke into your life and you've kept that with you? And I hope you all have those times. Because the Bible says, as, as, as iron sharpens iron, so another man sharpens another. And, and as that happens in our life, and, and there's sometimes it's a file in it, in it, and it strikes us, but it leaves a mark in us that sharpens us in our lives. Sometimes I, I, I think maybe a question that we can ask ourselves and when we go into prayer and say, Lord, what lessons have you taught me about fatherhood? Instead of saying, what do you want me to say about fatherhood? What is it that you've really taught me about fatherhood? Can I just share with you some thoughts that came to my mind that I feel is maybe important this morning and in the day that we live? Many times I've had opportunities to do funerals. And sometimes I say I enjoy doing a funeral more than I do a wedding. Why, why is it you might be, well, what the heck are you talking about? Because in a wedding, everyone's all hyped up and fired up. And after the wedding, you know, it's a big party. Where a funeral, people really get in touch with themselves. They get in touch that, you know, there is an end to my life. And, and sometimes they're more real about things. And when I have a time to, to talk with sometimes the children of a, a parent that passed away or a father that passed away, sometimes they're carrying grievances. And even there's been times that at the funeral, there's arguments that break out. And, and I said, wait, this is not the time for this. This is the time to honor your father. But they're so full of stuff, that anger, that, that, that even at the time of the funeral, they're not even interested in honoring their father. They're already arguing about different things and, and what they're going to get and what they're not going to get and who's going to get what. They had ages they've had something that they held that 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 the father maybe should have done to their lives or maybe that they failed to do in their lives and and now they're they're holding this i think that we all need to come to a place that we come to a place that we're able to forgive our father and sometimes it requires counseling. And I don't mean to say this lightly because the impact of a, of a negative impact of a father you carry for your life if you don't learn to forgive and to let go. And I believe that probably only the purest way to do that is really with the help of God. And, and we're not going to go far into this. But I know something that really helped me as I understood my father and my father's role. As I understood that he was just human. That, that he made mistakes. And, and then I had to look at myself and think of the scriptures that who among anybody have not sinned. And maybe my father's sin I was fallen to be a part of, but maybe it was something that he was dealing with and I just happened to be in the picture. But how I viewed that as a child and how I interpret all those things is maybe even my interpretation of that could be just how I viewed it. And maybe not about maybe what was all going on. And so, as I want my children for to give, forgive me for maybe the things that I have done, uh, not really wanting to hurt them, but I hurt them, I want to be able to forgive my father. On the cross, the Lord looked at his executioners surrounding them. And he, in Luke 23, 34, Profoundly, he says, Father, forgive them. He prayed for him his heart on the cross while he was being crucified. They know not what they do. 
And so many times we're, we receive things from maybe our fathers and others that they really don't know what they do. They're falling into something, but we're the ones that get hurt in the process. One of the shining lights of Jewish history and one of the most popular Old, T, Old Testament people is King David. He was a singer and he was a, a poet. He was a man that God said he's a man after my own heart. And for the most part, an example of what a godly ruler should be. But however, the, to his children, he was anything but an example of a role model. He failed miserably at being a father. You can read 2 Samuel, the 12th through the 18 chapters, and it tells the whole story, and we're not going to go in that. But it's a story of his family, and the key person is Absalom. And Absalom was a young man. He was extraordinary promises, whose life was ruined or hijacked by the incest that took place in his family. His own half-brother raped his sister. And uh, he was so angry, but when he saw his father, David, did nothing about it, and from his viewpoint, did nothing about it, he himself put together a plan to kill his own brother, his half-brother, Amon. And then he fled for his life, knowing that surely David would be enraged and would punish him. But to his amazement, David once again, being passive, stood by and did nothing. Gradually, Absalom was so filled with rage and anger against his father that he led a full-scale rebellion to overthrow the kingdom. And he wanted to seize the kingdom and take it over. But it actually ended up resulting in his own death. One can just hear Absalom saying about his father, David, yeah, yeah, such a godly man. Such a man after God's own heart. What a joke. That guy's nothing but a hypocrite. And that wouldn't be the first time that children saw their parents in a different form from what others saw them in church. We don't want to fault Absalom all for his anger because he had every right to fault David for his negligence as a, as a parent, being a bad father, and his failures as even being a king. We could wish, however, that Absalom had found it in his heart to forgive his father. His hatred and his resentment, his anger, ended up destroying him and bringing great suffering to the kingdom and destroyed not only the family, but the kingdom itself. His part was inexcusable also. So we need to realize that all of us come to struggles at times, and there needs to be a huge area of our lives of allowing us to forgive, forgive our fathers, to forgive others. And what, again, is easy for us to first remember is that our fathers and every father is that we're human. We're prone to failure. We fall great short of what God wants us to be at times and what we desire to be. Many fathers, even though on the outside, look like they've done a pretty good job. A lot of fathers are full of regret because of what they could have done, what they should have done, what they wanted to do, but they never achieved it. And so there's sometimes a lot of blame and a lot of hurt that a father carries, but no one even ever knows it because it's own heart that breaks of the what ifs. Well, I could have. I should have. Psalms 103.14 reminds us that, well, Romans 3.23, it says that we've all come short in, from the glory of God. And in Psalms 103, it reminds us that God is well aware of, of ourselves. He says he himself knows how we're formed. And he remembers that we are from dirt, dust. And, and, and what I like to say is that and he remembers that we're just dirt, fathers. We're just dirt bags, and we fall short. We flounder. Dads are not perfect, and we make plenty of mistakes, and our children, as they grow older, need to remember that 
that we're all imperfect and we all need forgiveness. And we ourselves, the children, they need to come to a place of realizing that, yeah, my dad is flawed, but boy, I got some flaws of my own too that, that God is working on in my own life. And being human, we all need to require an extra dose of God's grace to be able to forgive each other. You know, grace is a gift that we all have. What, what is grace? Grace is getting something you don't deserve. And there's times that I may not deserve to be forgiven, but it's a gift that is given to me. Not because I deserved it, not because I did anything to earn it, I gave it to me. We were at a person's house for dinner and the, the, the husband and wife were staying in our home and we went over to the parents' house and had a great meal together. And, and then coming home, I heard of the story and, and, and the story was of how this woman was sexually abused over and over again by her father. And then her mother would reject that even when she came and told her mom, her mom wouldn't accept it and just push it out and said, no, that's not happening. She came to her sisters and she was rejected by her sisters while she continued to be abused. But she came to a place that God got into her life and she was able to forgive her father. And today they have a relationship that I just scratched my head. But she has completely forgiven her father that we sat down, we had a meal together. They get together every time they come into town. She's really learned again to love her father. Now, it doesn't mean that she'll trust her children with her father because of fearful of abuse, but she's learned to love her father and have a love relationship. Trust is something that's earned also, and I'm not going to go into trust and forgiveness, but trust is earned. And when you break that trust and relationship, it takes a long time to earn that back again. But we need to learn to forgive, and forgiveness comes first. Trust follows later. A father is a product of a fallen world. And, you know, we are flawed. Sometimes fathers have become alcoholics. Sometimes they've become a wife beater, or or they're never home. They're an absent father, or they're a workaholic. Whatever it may be that, that, that came against you and how your father was in you, remember to, that we need to look at that our parents fail and, and, and they have faults and they've come fallen short and, and we don't know what parents they had that, that maybe their upbringing wasn't the best and so they've learned to do certain things certain ways and, and they're in a growing moment of their selves. And we need to come to a place that that we're able to be able to give to them that gift of forgiveness, the gift of grace, the gift that it's my power, it's my decision. Even though it's not deserved, I can give that gift of grace, that gift of forgiveness to a person who doesn't deserve it. Because why? Because God first gave it to me and forgave me for my sin. We all at time needs a place that I, I, I believe we all stumble and fall with somebody or some place that, that we need that gift sometime given to you. And in a sense that if you, we all want it, but it's another thing that can you give it? In Matthew 6, 12, it says, and forgive us our debts as we, all have, as we have forgiven our debtors. When you've been wrong, all of a sudden that person has become your debtor. And we can look at it that way that there's a debt there, but you forgive that debt. Because why? God forgave your debt. And then forgiveness that takes place is, a, is an open channel for grace to be able to flow through. And there's a resentment that clogs us up and shuts us off and causes even health problems in our lives and can cause all kinds of grievances in our lives that God's daily supply of grace can now continually flow into our lives. All of a sudden, there's a release that's been bottled up into us because we didn't open up the gate, if you will, and let the waters flow out of us of resentment. When we forgive somebody, there's a flow, there's a release that's all been bottled up to us, and all of a sudden, we're the ones that are getting blessed, even though we're the ones that are given the grace to forgive. 
There's a loosening of demonic oppression. That there's a spiritual battle that goes on in all our lives. And if we hold it in, I believe that Satan has an open field in us to be able to attack us and have all kinds of strongholds in our life unless we let those things go and let forgiveness flow. There's so much that goes on in having forgiveness or unforgiveness in our lives. Pastor Gary Inrig writes this, Forgiveness is ultimately an act of the will. Not a stirring of the emotions. For a Christ follower, it's a choice to obey God and let it go. This is an inward choice that produces a declaration given, a promise spoken. I forgive you. Now, I'm going to take a break right here. Maybe there's someone coming into your mind right now. I would just ask that as this person comes in your mind, would you, would you right now just say, I forgive you in your heart, in your mind, say, I forgive you right now, have the grace enough to be able to say to that person. And I believe that the Holy Spirit will bring people in your mind, be able to say, I forgive you. Why? Because I've been forgiven. And see, when we speak those words, I'll get back to what this pastor wrote here. He says, I declare that, that it's an issue between us. All of a sudden, that issue between us is dead and it's buried. I'm saying that I will not rehearse it, I will not review it, and I will not renew it. When it comes to my mind, I will take it to the Lord and to the foot of the cross. And there is where I let it loose from my life. And every time Satan tries to come back and and throw that in you to make you trip and fall, you say, Satan, that's been forgiven, and I lay it before the foot of the cross. We have to live our lives that way, folks. If not, we, we get so many things built up into us that we carry such a heavy burden, it's like we're carrying a backpack of unforgiveness because we haven't released it. And it's painful. It's not easy. But as you, we do that, there's such a blessing that comes to us. So if you've been hurt, abused in spiritually, emotionally, physically, find a way, I employ you this morning, to forgive. As I was thinking through the message The other thing that came to my mind that I've learned as a father is that what's important is what real men should know. What is it that real men should know? When I first became a Christian, man, I didn't know what it was to be a Christian. I didn't have a godly father. I I had a good father, a kind father, a hardworking father, workaholic father, you know, but a a father, I never heard the words, I love you. You know, that just wasn't expressed. And many of you that are my age had the same thing, but, but he did his best at what he knew to be a father. Well, maybe in my perception, it wasn't the best, but it was his best. Um, but I was searching and I saw it and I tried to find other men who, who would take me on as their spiritual fathers that I can learn and grow what a father was all about. There was a grandfather with an eight-year-old granddaughter. And, uh, and, and the granddaughter was speaking to her mother, Julie. And, and they, he, she was asking a lot of children a, a, a lot about how, how babies come about. And... Um, the daughter was trying to teach her about childbirth, which is very difficult at eight years old. And um, so after that conversation, she came to her, her grandfather and they're out playing out the yard as grandpa's kind of do. And she just said, I- I'm not going to have any children, grandpa. And, and uh, she goes, it just hurts too bad. And uh, you know how they can get sometimes. And the, fa- and the grandfather, hmm, he said, his first thoughts that he thought about was to tell her that, well, if, if your mommy felt that way, then, then after her brother, she probably wouldn't have had you and your sister. And, and, then, and then after that, maybe if her, her, if her mom didn't feel that way, then she wouldn't have been born. And, and we all might have not been. Maybe my great-grandma would have felt that way. And, you know, and... and 
we would never, all, none of us would be here. But what he said was this, that yes, honey, it does hurt, but, but the pain goes away and you're left with this beautiful child and you decide that it was worth all the pain. And the pain was little compared to the great joy and happiness it brought. And the eight-year-old girl just thought for a minute and she looked at her grandpa and she looked him right by and says, yeah, but you're a man and you just don't know. <laughs> and they both fell on the grass just laughing their heads off. His wonderful granddaughter was exactly right. Everything he knew on the subject, he learned from a woman. He, he, he learned from his wife. He learned from reading. You're a man. What do you know? That's a great question. It's a great sermon. And as I, as I think about this, I think, well, what real men, what is it really important that we know? Well, let me just share with you a couple thoughts on that. One is that I think it's really important is, is who I am as a man. The man that does not know who he is will be forever trying to find out. And he'll try to prove himself a man in unhealthy ways if he's unsure about who he is. So I ask you men, who are you? The other question is, whose I am? Whose I am? You see, if he's accountable to anyone on his own or in this world, the man who knows that, that he was created by God and the almighty God, in a sense, is his father, and that he's been redeemed by a loving Savior, he's likely to live differently than if he felt like he came from a tadpole. You know what I mean? You know, that he just happened to come from, uh, you know, a line of apes, and he's just in the lineup of all those Neanderthals. But God chose to give us birth and to give us life and to create us. The other question to look at is, what am I here for? What am I here for? As a man, what are you here for? I believe a man needs to know what his role is in life. Why are you put here on earth? What's your purpose? Is it to find yourself, express yourself, fulfill yourself? Or is there a higher calling in your life? A higher noble purpose that God has for you? You see, the trouble is, is when we try to fill ourselves, it's always empty. It's a vacuum that keeps sucking and sucking and sucking and never gets filled. But when we find God and we find that higher purpose that he desires us to live for, there's a fulfillment that comes that, that no vacuum, it's not a vacuum, it gets filled. The last question is, where am I going? Where am I going? Where are you going in life? Do you know where you're going? I love the testimony of Job. In the midst of his pain and suffering, in the darkness of his soul's depression, still his faith was intact. When he was all by himself, everyone else deserted him. His faith was intact. When he stood in the gap, all by himself, the church deserted him. His friends deserted him. His faith was intact. And he called out in Job 19, 25, and 27. He says, he says I know my re that my Redeemer lives. I know that my Redeemer lives. And he hung on those words. I know my Redeemer lives. And, and that in the end, he will stand on earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes and not another how my heart yearns within me. I know my Redeemer lives. Is that your heart's cry, men? When you come against the wall? When you just feel like you can't go on anymore? I know my Redeemer lives. 
the Apostle Paul wrote, and he testified in 2 Timothy 1.12. He says, in verses 1.12, that it is why I'm suffering as I am, yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Paul, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of times that, that he was beaten, that he was shipwrecked, that his life was not, not a fairy tale. Man, he had a hard life following after God. He suffered greatly, but he said that I know whom I have believed. And in the times, in those tough times, again, if you know whom you believe, they get you through the hard times. It's that anchor that holds in the storm. And the Apostle John put it this way in 1 John 2, 3. He says this, we know that we have come to know. Come to know what? Come to know him. We know that we have come to know him. And then I like to pause. It says, if we keep his commands. <laughs> if we stay faithful. If we don't give in. We know that we have come to know. You see, we need to come to a place that we know that we know that we know that God is there for us and that we're his son and that we're living for him and that we're his child, that I am the son of God. He's my daddy. I know that. And it keeps me in the place when I feel like everything else is upside down. I turn to my father and I hold on to my daddy. Because my daddy's there for me. And how, how do I know this? Or how can other people see this in my life? How can I see it in your life? Well, it says if we keep his commands. You see, how well you know your daddy is going to be how well you do when issues come in your life. Where do you go to first? You go to your daddy first and say, as a child, we wouldn't help me, daddy. Pick me up, daddy. I need you, daddy. When we get older, we want to go to the bar. We want to go to our depression medication. We want to do uh, pornography. We want to do whatever bad habits to fulfill that need that our daddy used to fulfill. And we got to change that. We got to fight against that. We got to go against the behavior patterns that this world has set that says that if you have a hard time, go to the bar and get drunk and pick up a chick. Is there proof, men, in your life? Is there proof, men, in your attitude? Is there proof, men, in your actions? Is there proof in your thought life? Men, I want to challenge you this morning. Fathers, I want to challenge you this morning to be leaders, to be men that will take a stand, to be the spiritual leaders that God wants you to be in your hand, to, to be godly men at home. Our wives, our women in our church, our young girls that we're raising are desperately looking for godly men that they can trust. Where are they, men, if we're not examples for the next generation? We're a generation ago, uh, away from losing the church, aren't we? We're a generation away from that. We've got to be spiritual fathers for the younger ones growing up to be the example, to be husbands, to be godly men, to how to live a godly way. Scriptures talk about things that will last forever, and I'm closing with this thought. It says what lasts forever, and I use this in funerals a lot. It says the love of God, the word of God, and the character of a man will last forever. Well, what, 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 what does it mean by that? I, I think what it means is that it, because it gets passed down to generation. To gen, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. I, I've got my father's characteristics in me. We, we, are a, we are a product of our family. And that gets passed down to the next generation. And sometimes it says the sins of the father are passed down to how many generations, Ted? But it also says the blessing 
of the Father can be passed down also to the generation, to the next generation. I want to pass down blessing. I'm tired of passing down the curses. But men, we have to make a choice for that because it's not going to come by just sitting around and doing nothing. It takes from us working hard at proving our lives to be faithful to our God. Let us stand. No, no, no. I want you just right now to just bow your heads. Bow your heads and your hearts. And we're going to have a closing, some music for them. Let me challenge you with this thought as your heads are bowed. We are not just living for our lifespan. We are not just living for our lifespan. We are living to pass down what God has placed to us. This church is standing because of the the vision and the thought of other men and women who've come to this church and given their lives for this church. There's people who, who've, who've, in a sense, given their lives to be able to have what we have today. They've sacrificed and they gave. Not only of their time, not only of money, but they gave of their lives. We're all a product of, of a generations before us, and now we have the responsibility to pass on what's been given to us. And I want to challenge you men, especially this morning. I want to challenge you to be able to commit your lives afresh to God today. To stand in the gap. To be willing to say, yes, I'm going to be committed to my God. I'm going to be committed to my family. I'm going to be committed to the church. And give of myself. I want to ask you men just afresh today that if you're willing, that you would just stand in your place. Just stand in your place and we're going to commit this time to God. Are you willing to stand in the gap for your family, to be a godly husband, to be a godly father, to be a man of God, that you can be a spiritual father to the next generation growing up? Those kids are Sunday school, are going to be the ones that are going to be leading our worship, leading our children, teaching Bible studies carrying the torch for the Lord, carrying the church for the Lord, that this church can still be a lighthouse to Elmira. So, Father, we come to you now in Jesus' name, committing our fresh, our lives to you, Lord, to be men of God, to be men of God, worthy of the calling in which you've called us to that we know, that we know, that we know, that we've come to know you and that we'll keep your commands in our heart and in our lives. We'll keep your ways and live faithfully to you as fathers, as husbands, as men of God. And Father, so we commit afresh to you. And Lord, we just ask you to forgive us of our wrongs doing. And we take all our wrongdoing and we just right now throw it at the foot of the cross. And we abandon those things in Jesus' name and ask you to cover it with the blood of Christ. Cover it with the blood of Christ. And we ask a fresh our commit to you to live our lives today. And we do this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all the women of the church say, louder women. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together and give God the glory. Hi, I'm Pastor John McConnell, and I'd like to welcome you today for watching our program. It's just amazing the technology we have today that we're able to live stream all around the world. And we'd like to give you an opportunity, if you'd like to give towards this ministry, you can go online and be able to uh, follow the directions that are on there and be able to give to the ministry that you've been watching. So God bless you. We thank you for being part of Southside Alliance Church today.